Anything else? Lab scores are on the back. And use that. You want to may want to use that ruler. Just make sure you only look at your. Yeah. So the um, lecture today is from chapter nine. Uh, I, it may be the only thing we're doing in chapter nine, I don't know, but we need to do this. We're gonna do the essentials of acoustics in what are called cavities. Um, this is for the experiment this afternoon. You'll get into this more in depth in, in the, next, the next acoustics course. So the idea here is that uh, when you have sound waves, you can have boundaries, right? So sound can be confined in one dimension or two dimensions or three dimensions. When we, when sound, when we have a one-dimensional situation where we have sound that's confined, that's um, with some kind of terminations at the end. We usually call that a pipe. Okay, and I'll use, I'll, we'll, we'll refer, in our, in our calc, in our theory here, I'll talk about pipe modes. I'm just talking about a standard that we like we just got discussing in chapter 10. A pipe with one dimensional waves. Um, we use the word cavity when we have a two or three dimensional confinement. Okay, like you can have a, a rectangular box. We're gonna do that first, a rectangular cavity. Um, sometimes a situation like that may not involve anything in one dimension, so it's effectively a two-dimensional problem. So that's a two-dimensional cavity. Now, if you have some kind of confinement, but one or two dimensions is infinite, and you've got propagation, that's called a waveguide. And that's the subject of the next acoustics course. <coughs> so um, acoustics and cavities is important for a lot of reasons. Um, it's a standard thing in physical acoustics. It's a you know, one of the basic ideas is it's a, by confining the sound, you can get more precise data, you can, uh, and, or you can focus on simpler theoretical situations, for example, like than sound in the ocean, which is extremely complicated. So that's often done in physical acoustics. It has a lot of applications in architectural acoustics, which is, over the decades, has become more and more imp important. People are paying a lot more attention to this. Now, um, and I want to point out here that you, you need to know before you do waveguides next quarter, you need to do cavities. So that's one of the reasons we're doing them, doing them here. The main problem here is to find all of the possible standing wave modes. So we're going to be looking for mo standing waves of a definite frequency, okay? And we need to find all of those. And it's uh, one of the reasons it's important is when you, we're going to be neglecting drive, neglecting dissipation and have no drive, okay? But in a realistic situation, when you have drive and dissipation, you know why these modes are important here, these standing wave modes. They're going to become the, they're going to be the resonances. So the simplest place to begin here is a rectangular cavity. So here's what we mean. Uh, the s sound is confined to this three-dimensional region here. And here's our coordinate system. Uh, we use these L's to be the, the three lengths. We're going to assume rigid walls. You can generalize this. The other simple boundary condition is pressure release boundary condition. We're just gonna stick to rigid walls here. Um, so what, in fact, we have a rigid wall. If you look in the X direction, in the X direction here, that means that x is equal to zero, which corresponds to the yz plane here. The sound can have no x component of the, the particle velocity can have no x component because it's a rigid wall, okay? Similarly, over here, the other wall that's parallel to this wall, at, at uh, x equals lx, we have to have no particle velocity in the x direction. And then you can go along here and replace x, these two x's with y's, that gets you this boundary condition in the y direction and similarly for z. So um, 
What this boundary condition means is, we, we can see what it means from Euler's equation. Here's the linearized Euler's equation. Because there's no x velocity at x equals 0 and lx, it means that uh, we'll have an antinode in the, anti in the pressure here. It means the partial p with respect to x has to be 0, because this is equal to 0 on those two, in the two walls here. So we have to have antinodal pressure boundary conditions here. Um, in the x direction, it's the same in the y and z. x and y and z are all interchangeable in this case. Okay, so we're going to look for these standing wave modes. These are definite frequency solutions. They look like this. The acoustic pressure is some function of x, y, and z. And this is the complex pressure, of course. We have one frequency here. We're going to, we want to get all of these modes. Now, the standard approach, we're, we're dealing with a partial, the wave equation is a partial differential equation, right? I guess I didn't write it out here, but you know, this is partial derivatives in here. The standard approach in dealing with just about all partial differential equations is th there's really just one basic method here. There are more complicated methods, but there's one basic method that usually works, especially in applications, and it's to assume what's called a separable solution. So we're going to assume that this is not just any function of x, y, and z here, that it can be factored such that it's a function of only x times a function of only y times a function of only z. So by, by x here, we mean there are no y's and z's in here. There, of course, can be parameters. You know, we're going to have parameters here. But there's no, um, no y and z, no x and z, no x and y. So that's the first step here. How many people have seen this before or recall this? OK. So this is a pretty serious step. And you may wonder, well, so we go from here to here. What if we miss some solutions here? You'd worry about that, right? Well, what happens, and this almost always happens in applications, is in the end, we see that we, we carry through with this. We find all, these, we find all the <coughs> solutions. We then find that we can represent any excitation in the cavity, no matter what any acoustical excitation here. Uh, we're not going to show this, but it's known that any excitation can be represented as a superposition. Of it. We're going to end up with an infinite number of modes here. And because this is linear acoustics, you can, super, you can add them together. So we're going to find that any excitation, no matter what, you can go in there with a blank gun, and this is, people do this in reverberation rooms, OK? You can go there with a, a blank, you know what a, do you guys know what a blank gun is? That's something really old. It's a, it's a, it's a gun that fires blanks. This is pretty obvious. But <laughs> I, don't know, I haven't, they're real popular when I was a kid, and I, I haven't mentioned a blank gun in many decades. So I just don't know if it's the same terminology now. So you can do that to do, look at echo studies, you know, whatever you want to do. So that's far from a standing, nice, steady state standing mode, right? Sounds bouncing around in there and complicated. Um, but it can be represented as a superposition. We're going to find that. So this method is justified at the end. It's, re it's a, very, a very standard method in partial differential equations. Some of you have seen it before. OK, so here's the wave equation, right? We're neglecting dissipation here, which is typical, which is often a good approximation. We shove this form into here. Two time derivatives is going to bring down a minus omega squared, right? And the e to the i omega t is going to, I didn't even comment, it's going to, obviously, it's going to cancel here. And this is what you get. You can just do this in your head. This quantity here, we will call k squared. We're going to use k is equal to omega over c. We've used omega is equal to ck very often in this class. We really, technically, this is just a definition. Okay. It'll end up being a kind of wave number, but we, you want to think of this here as, as a definition. Okay. The next thing we do, and you'll see why in a moment, is we divide by x, y, z. So we replace this with k squared, divide by x, y, z, and now we get this. And now comes the first 
reason that this method of separation, this separ separable solution assumption is used. This term right here is at most a function of x. It cannot be a function of y or z by assumption. Okay? Similarly, this is at most a function of y and this is at most a function of z. Suppose I vary x, but I keep y and z constant. In general, we, this could change, right? What, what happens here? This is a constant. We don't know what it is yet, that's okay. It's like some constant. What happens when I change x here and here? It doesn't change. So what do we conclude? When I change x here, how does this change? It cannot change, it has to be a constant. And we make a, come up with a similar conclusion for there. So we set x prime, x double prime over x equal to what's called a separation constant. That's what they call it. And it's convenient here, and you wouldn't know this unless you've solved the problem, to make it <coughs> minus kx squared, okay? Don't worry, you know, why, you don't need to worry about this right now. To be completely general, this could, we're not specifying this yet, this could be a complex number. So don't worry about the minus sign there. This could be imaginary when you get rid of the minus sign. So we, similar, we have a difference in general, a different separation constant in the y and in the z. Okay, well now you can see why it's, it's convenient here to write like this. When we multiply through here, we get just the equation for the simple harmonic equation. We know it in the solutions are sinusoids, right? Very simple. Now I want to point out here that there is, these are not all arbitrary, the separation constants here. We, we have to have a solution to the wave equation. So when I replace this with minus kx squared minus ky squared minus kz squared, we see that we have to have, the total k squared has to be the sum of the individual squares. We have to have that for a solution to exist. All right. So, this method of separation of variables, um, the idea behind it is you start off with a partial differential equation and now we've, we've reduced it to a collection of ordinary. <coughs> These are ordinary differential equations here. You know, we wouldn't use the partial sign here. I'm, I'm using primes for compactness. We wouldn't use the partial sign here because this is only a function of x. Just, so it's just a derivative, normal derivative. Okay, so this is what we have so far. We, do, we have to have, this condition has to be true. We know what uh, the solutions of this are gonna be. It's gonna be sines and cosines of, of kx times x. But now let's impose the boundary condition in the x direction. And I didn't, I didn't write it out here, but you, you know what's gonna happen here. We have to have the, a pressure anti-node. We have to have no slope on this function here. So it's going to be, in the x direction here, going from x to lx, we're going to have the lowest mode is going to look like this. It's going to be, and the next one up is going to look like this. Maybe I should dash this. Okay, so these are the typical string type modes or pipe modes. These are pipe modes for a closed, closed pipe. So we can write down the solution to x. It's very simple. It's this arbitrary constant, <coughs> arbitrary amplitude, cosine of kx times x. You, we all know this. And um, so that meets the boundary condition at x equals zero. We have zero slope. To meet the boundary, and you've all seen this before, I'm just reminding you. To meet the boundary condition at L, we take the derivative of this and set it equal to zero. And it will only be true for these discrete values, these particular values of kx here. So we've discretized the kx. kx has to be an integral, num uh, integral number of pi's divided by Lx, because we've got to have the anti-node there. And this integer here, now this is, okay, I can see a potential problem here. All right, now look what I've, this is an L's an integer. Is, is this right? Well, it is and it isn't, okay? And I didn't realize this until right now. <laughs> What, I, um, what about this x l equals zero? Is that a solution? Well, for, a, for just a pipe, if that's all that you have is a pipe, when you have this one-dimensional wave in the pipe, you can't have kx equal to zero because what would you have there? 
you'd have just a constant pressure. You'd have zero frequency. Omega would be zero. Omega is equal to CK would be zero. You'd have no variation. That's not an acoustic mode, okay? So we would have to rule that out. However, the reason that I, I have it in here is we're not done yet. We've got other modes here. We don't have just a pipe mode in general. So we need to hold on to this, okay? So the complete solution is going to be um, for arbitrary indices here, these, these in integers, L, M, and N, remember, we, this goes back to our separability assumption. That's going to be our solution. So we plug this in, and here's what we get. We have these essentially pipe modes in the x, y, and z directions. The frequency here, the square of the frequency, will be c squared k squared, where we know what k squared is, it's given by this. So that means we found our so-called spectrum, okay, our spectrum of frequencies. And usually we list this as, not as angular frequencies, but as real frequencies, this is which we use in experiments. So there's a factor of 2 pi, you take the square root, factor of 2 pi, and here's what you get. So these are the possible frequencies. <coughs> And they occur for anti, any integers here, pop, non-negative integers, with one exception, right? We can't have all of these equaling zero because then we would have zero, we'd have nothing. That would be equilibrium. There'd be no sound in the box. So, but you can have, two of these can be zero, or one of them can be zero. So that's why I held on to it here. So there's kind of a proviso or something here. You, um, you can't have all of these equal to zero because you wouldn't have a sound mode. But other than that, we've found the modes. And there's, you know, there's obviously an in infinite, technically an infinite number of these here. And um, each e of these standing waves, and each standing wave is, is, is specified by these three integers here. So what this is, is you're all familiar, as I mentioned, you're all familiar with a one-dimensional pipe. This is the three-dimensional version of a one-dimensional pipe. This is how it gets generalized. The pipe is a special case here. If you set, for example, M and N equal to zero, you got a pipe. And then you have to start from one. Okay, so this is pretty simple, right? Well, it gets a little bit more complicated here. So to, in to in investigate this further, let's, Let's go to two dimensions. Okay, this is in general three dimensions, but let's not worry about one dimension. So how can we do <coughs> that? Well, the standard experimentally, the standard thing that you can do here, and this is what will be done in the experiment is, if we have a rectangular volume here that's, oops, that has a small, the LZ value is relatively small, Okay, so here's the z direction. If this is, if this right here, if LZ is much smaller than LX and LY, then I'm not going to have anything going on in the z direction unless, um, unless the frequency is sufficiently large, right? So the lowest mode here is a half wavelength mode, and this is a tiny distance, so the frequency is going to be up there. So as long as we make this small enough so that the, freq the fundamental frequency here with a half wavelength, here it is right here, this half wavelength, if that's beyond our, our you know, any frequency of interest to us, we've got essentially a two-dimensional problem. We don't have to worry about what's going on in the z direction. So this is what's going to happen in the experiment this afternoon. That's not going to be rectangular. It's going to be the more interesting case and the more standard case of a, of a cylinder. Okay, but I don't know if any of you've been in the lab to see it, but it's typically about this big and it's got a height like this. But you will go to a sufficiently high frequency to excite the first mode here, just so you can see it. Okay, but for right now, just to understand what's going on, let's look in the. Um, we're going to look in just the x and the y direction. We're going to suppress the z direction. Um, now, we're going to assume, just for definiteness, that the, the LX dimension, LX is bigger than LY. All right? Just for 
for, like I say, for definiteness here. That means the lowest frequency mode. And incidentally, you know, the lowest frequency mode in a, in a cavity is almost always important in acoustics. So we have this special name for it, right? It's the fundamental mode, and then over the decades they drop mode, so people just call it fundamental. So fundamental, I guess, is both a noun and an adjective there. Here it's a noun. I don't know if that causes you trouble. Probably doesn't. <laughs> but uh, it may eventually occur to you, you know, you call it the, fun the fundamental. But it's very, you've already probably experienced this. It's very important, you know, to know what the fundamental is. It's usually always important. So our fundamental is going to be the one zero zero mode because at, we're assuming that LX is the biggest mode. Now, as you um, sweep frequency here, you're going to find that there are, of course, higher modes. If you have put in damping and drive, there's going to be resonances, and they will correspond, as I said earlier, to our modes, our standing wave modes that we found here. What it, often, what's, a, what's important here is the order in which they occur in frequency, all right? So I have to tell you something here. There is no formula to generate, and you'll be encountering this in this different geometry in the experiment, okay? There is no formula that tells you how those modes are ordered. You just have to calculate them, all right? So let me show you what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Let's, um, let's go to, we need, a, we need a diagram at this point. We are, we really need a diagram, okay? So here's the um, x direction. Here's the y direction. We're assuming that Lx is greater than Ly. So our lowest frequency mode is going to be this, this half wavelength mode here. This dashed line represents a node. So as, often, as you know in acoustics, a, a big thing that, you know, off, that people often do is they look at the nodal surfaces, right? So here the nodal surfaces are just planes. There's a z direction out here, but we're neglecting that, right? We're imagining we have, there's no modes being excited there. We're not worried about that. So here's the fundamental. <coughs> you know that you're going to have pipe modes here. You're going to have, these are just simple pipe modes here, where you add a half a wavelength. So here's the half, the fundamental half wavelength mode. The next mode up for the X pipe modes is going to be one wavelength, then it's going to be three halves, etc. Okay? And the da again, the dashed lines represent the nodal, nodal planes in this case. What about looking at the, the, in the y direction? There's obviously going to be a pipe modes there, right? This will be the lowest frequency mode. This mode will be at a higher frequency in this mode because LX is bigger, obviously, okay? And just as we had these pipe modes marching off here to, to large or infinite value, we can do the same thing here. Same idea, right? Um, Now, there are other modes, though, and here's an example. There are mixed modes that involve motion in both the x and the y directions. Here the motion's only in the x direction, here it's only in the y direction. This is mixed here, as you can see. This is the 1-1 one, one mode. There's a nodal plane here and a nodal plane there. And um, now, there, here's an example of these mixed modes. There's the, this is the lowest frequency mix mode. There's going to be the 2-1 mode, two, in this two, nodal, two nodal planes. You'll notice the index here refers, it happens to be equal to the number of nodal surfaces. That's nice. So you can just, you can march along here and just generate all of these things. Now I want to make, um, hold on, let me check and see if I'm right. So let's get, maybe I should get back to this. This is the lowest frequency mode. What's the next one up? up? Anybody? Two. This one? Okay, anybody think this is one? <laughs> you don't know. It depends upon the, in this, the aspect ratio. The ratio, you know, you can think of it as L, LX over LY or LY over LX, doesn't matter. So it's going to, going to depend upon the aspect ratio. So you have to, you know, you've got a specific system. You want to know what the next one up is. You have to calculate. There's no formula that exists. Students often want, you know, ask about this. They want to know. So where's the formula? 
Well, no one's been able to come up with it. I don't think they're going to be able to, okay? So you just have to calculate them for your specific case. Um, I was making sure I'm not missing something here. Now, <coughs> here's something that always throws students, everybody, I remember going through this, everybody goes through this. You're going to think of this as, oh, it's just a superposition of this mode and that mode. Okay, that's not true. We found the modes here, and by modes we mean this has a definite frequency. There's nothing that stops me from adding this mode to this mode. In fact, we have an apparatus here that, where we do this. It's an acoustic box. I don't know if you've ever seen it in any demonstrations. A clear acoustics box with loudspeakers. It's mainly for nonlinear acoustics. That's probably why you haven't seen it. Um, <coughs> but you can certainly have add this mode to this mode. This mode has a pure frequency. If you add those two modes, you're gonna, that's a legitimate response of the system but it's got two, two frequencies. It's not a normal mode because it has two frequencies. So this is a different, this is different and it's not a superposition of those two. The math shows you this because you remember, here's where the math shows it to you. Remember our solution here is not a sum, it's a product. We multiply, it's a multiplication, so it's not the sum. Uh, okay, so does anybody have any questions about so far? Oh, there's a little, there's more here, sorry. Uh, I've already talked about this, these, the importance of these standing waves are is that in a realistic situation, <coughs> when you have this dissipation and you've got some kind of drive, this, these standing waves that we saw for, they're going to be the resonances. <coughs> Um, and how do, you, how do you experimentally probe those? Well, the standard way is with a traveling microphone or a traveling drive. So you, as we've discussed before in the pipe case, you can have a little tube with a microphone on the end and some wire leads going through the tube and you can move it along inside the cavity there and, and look for these, you know, typically what people look for are the pressure nodes. You can see what you've got. You'll do this in the experiment for the, for this, for the cylindrical cavity. You can also um, put a little source, have a little source, and move it along, right? And you might say, well, how do you get a little tiny source? You know, you can't have a loudspeaker. Well, you can. You can. You can actually use a dynamic mic... Uh, talk more about this in the transducer course, but um, you know what the dynamic microphone is? It's basically a speaker in reverse, a loudspeaker in reverse. It's got a moving coil. God, have we, did, did we talk about how a loudspeaker works in this course? Yeah. I, Briefly, I think, yeah. Oh, we should have, yeah, weeks, think, weeks ago, right. Yeah, Pardon me? I think in the chamber, we talked about it a little bit, and then... Oh. Did I talk about, you know, a voice coil in a magnetic field? Have I been through that? And it would be in here. Oh, wow. Hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, well, many of you probably uh, know about this, but it's, it's a simple idea. It's really amazingly simple. You know, it's, it's like the bicycle of acoustics. You know, it's really simple, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I don't want to get into it right now. I'm surprised. We'll, we'll definitely get into it in the transducers course, okay? No question about it. But you can run that in reverse. We call it actually reciprocally. And um, so you can actually take a dynamic microphone, which is now not, nowadays not the typical kind of microphone, but you can have it outside, put a long tube on there, Got to worry sometimes about resonances in the tube, but you can move the source around too. And to some extent, you will do that in the experiment too. You can move the source around to probe the sound field. And it gets interesting, as you'll see. Um, now, something of practical interest here. If you, let's say, well, this, this you can think of just a, the fundamental mode that we're just talking about here. 
So here's our room, you know, with our LX bigger than our LY. And um, suppose you want to put two loudspeakers in here to listen to, you know, audio, right? What if you put, um, what if you, let, let's just look at one, spe one speaker will be fine here. Let's look at one speaker. Suppose you put the speaker here, which is, if you had just one speaker, which I guess nobody has nowadays, but if you did, <laughs> everyone has at least two, right? Um, <clears throat> there's a problem with the speaker being here. There's a big problem. And let me make it a little smaller here on this scale. Do you see what the problem is? Let's go to our diagram here. So here we have a loudspeaker right here. You're not going to excite this mode, the fundamental mode, because you're right at the node there. And I think the best way to see this is, let's go back to a string. Let's go back to 3119, right? If I've got a, um, a string here, and I want to excite this, this is the, oh, let's look at Fix, typical fixed fixed string, okay? I'm changing the boundary conditions here from what we have, but it doesn't matter. And I want to exert a, a force over some small length here to, to excite this, to excite this. What if I apply the force right here, okay? So the force is going to have some spatial extent, okay? But it's applied evenly, symmetrically about this node here. Imagine you're pushing on that string. Can you excite this mode? No. You got the wrong symmetry. Okay, if you move it over to here, yeah, now you say symmetric, now, now you're going to pick, you know, you'll be, you can excite this, in some sense, this part of the wave, there's a negative excitation here, but this is going to beat it out. So if you try to drive the string perfectly symmetrically right here, you can't drive it. You can't put energy in. You could be putting energy into here, but you'd be taking it out from the other side. So you're not going to be able to feed any energy in. Well, the same thing happens with a loudspeaker here, moving like this. Mm -hmm. Essentially the same situation. So you don't want to put the loudspeaker there. Where do you want? In fact, here's, a, uh, here's an example. Suppose you put the loudspeaker, you have stereo, let's say. You put one here and one here. One one-sixth of the way, I guess this is one-sixth, yeah. So you put them, put them right here. Do you can see what the problem is going to be, right? You will not excite this mode. You will not excite that mode. So where do you want to put speakers? There's one place, well, there's several places here where you excite all the modes. It's in the corners. So you should always put loudspeakers in the corners. Now, ultimately, when you go to very high frequency mode, you won't be able, there'll be a problem there. But the, this is the optimum place, is in the corners. And the reason is, if you don't do that, for example, if you put here and here, you're, you're going to kill, and you'll kill other, there's other modes you'll kill too, higher order modes. You can, that, that have, any mode that has a nodal plane there is only going to be very weakly excited. Okay, so that's the rectangular cavity. We spend all, typically spend a lot of time on that because it's the simplest case. The same, I, the same ideas are going to apply to um, a much more common cavity, okay? This is analytically, the rectangular cavity is analytically the simplest. <coughs> but has anyone ever tried to build a box? I did kind of once in elementary school, and it was a lot of, for some science project, and I've never forgotten it, it's hard. It's hard to build a box. It's a lot easier to get some PVC pipe and, and cut out some end caps and glue them on or attach them to, you know, a cylinder is a much more common ca uh, cavity than a, rec a rectangular, you know, body, okay, cavity, than a rectangular cavity. This is much more common, much easier to deal with. And that's the one, as I said, we're going to deal with in the experiment. <coughs> so what are the bound, we're going to, again, some rigid walls. So the boundary conditions here are at the radius A, we can have no radial velocity. That means we have to have, by Euler's equation, we're going to have an anti-node, partial P with respect to R. 
And so this is just a pipe. This is just like the pipe mode. In this direction, it looks like a pipe, standard pipe. So we have that. We have the wave equation. There it is in its general form. And then now, now for the natural coordinates here are, of course, cylindrical coordinates. So you look up the Laplacian, unless you want to derive it. <laughs> uh, you look up, I used to do that. It's crazy. But um, here's the Laplacian in cylindrical coordinates. So you know we're going to have some more trouble here, right? It's not as simple as the rectangular. But the idea is the same. We look for a separable solution, OK? Plug it in. Now it's more complicated. We've got these R's floating around here. We divide by capital R, capital K, theta, capital Z to get this separation, right? And it's convenient here to also multiply by R squared. But it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Um, it just makes things a little easier. And now what do we do? OK, well, here we go. Let's, I guess I started with theta here. This is at most a function of theta. But you'll see no thetas anywhere else here by our separ separable assumption. So this cannot be a function of theta. If it changed, as you may cha change theta, these other terms don't change. So it, this has to be equal to a constant. We set that constant equal to minus m squared. Get the harmonic equation here with possible sines and cosines. And now, I want to point out to you here, and it's, it'll be important later on, <coughs> that when you superpose any sinusoids of the same frequency or whatever, it's equivalent to a sinusoid of that same frequency. There can be a phase shift there. So this is a, a, a trigonometric identity. You know, this is, you can, um, in other words, given an A and an M and a B, you can determine C and M and gamma here. Um, now, uh, this is kind of interesting. You know, we saw, we, we got discretization before because we had these boundaries here, but theta has, has no boundary, in, in, technically. But it repeats, right? So if you're in this, in this, if you're at a point here, you've got a certain pressure, a certain value of capital theta. If you go around 360 degrees, you better come back to the same, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't uh, necessarily happen in quantum mechanics, but this is classical mechanics, right? So it's got, it's got to be the same. So what that means is <coughs> this M here has to be um, an, an, a, a, a non-negative integer. For example, if this were 1 half, okay? Forget, suppose this is 0. Just look at this as a solution here. Suppose M is 1 half. When theta is equal to 0, we just get A, right? Now I go around, I increment theta by 2 pi. What is 1 half times 2 pi? Pi. What's the cosine of pi? Yeah. OK. So you've gone around once, and you haven't come back where you started from. Now, as I told you, this can happen in quantum mechanics. It's also, in some sense, can happen in classical physics. And there's this demonstration from the 1980s that probably nobody knows about anymore. But and you can do this. Oh, I haven't done this in a really not. No, I'm not going to do it. You can you can do it. You can do it with a coffee cup. I'm going to rotate this 360 degrees, right? Am I back to where I started from? No, I have to go twice. <laughs> so when I was in graduate school, we sometimes greeted each, each other. That was our greeting. <laughs> physics <laughs> physics graduate students do things like that, right? <laughs> So um, this is actually analogous to the fermion wave function in quantum mechanics. You have to rotate twice to get back to the same value. <coughs> so it gives, it's a big deal because it, every particle that's ever been gets split into two types of particles, whether either fermions or, or bosons. And fermions have the prop, well, that's enough. They have the property that when you rotate the system, the, the wave function changes sign. You can't observe that directly. You know, it's permissible. It's only the square of the wave function you, that you observe. Oh, so anyway, we end up with um, M being non-negative, a non-negative integer here. Uh, 
the Z equation, this is the pipe, pipe modes, right? No problem. Uh, we, boundary conditions, no problem, just like before. Okay, we'll call that index L, script L. Finally, the radial equation. We can beat it, into, this is the standard representation of the radial equation. Now, I'm playing some notational games here. This kappa is going to end up being an important quantity here. And kappa is, kappa squared is k squared, which is, um, you know, omega squared over c squared, mm -hmm. minus the wave number in the z direction. That turns out to be the relevant thing here, which is equal to this. So this is, um, <clears throat> this equation turns out to arise in an incredibly large number of applications. It's just unbelievable. And not necessarily when there's circular geometry. A lot of people think that, oh, it always comes up, you know, it it's only <coughs> comes up in circular geometry. It's called Bessel's equation, and it's just unbelievable. In fact, as an example, now that I think about it, not many people know this. Bessel, when he came up with Bessel's equation, he wasn't thinking of anything that had anything to do with a circle, circular geometry. He was dealing with a, um, a chain, you know, like a beaded chain of mass that, right? Uh, I don't know what those are used. They're sometimes sp sprocket chains. But you know what I'm talking about, right? What are those used for? Like a toilet chain? Yeah, there's a, good, there's a good application. That's an important application. Right. Every day? Yeah. Multiple yeah, multiple times, right? right. <laughs> so, um, so you know what I'm talking about, right? These beaded chains thing. He was looking at the problem of um, modes on a chain. So if you take a chain, and you've probably done this, and you drive it back and forth, you're gonna, you should do it if you haven't done it. I don't know if you want to use the toilet one. But what, <laughs> you drive this back and forth, and at certain frequencies, you're going to get resonances. Right? Now that's kind of a complicated problem. The, the tension is going, you know, the tension is greater than it's not like a, a horizontal string where the tension's constant. It's a more complicated problem. The tension's a function of position along the string. He was solving that, and believe it or not, and I don't think anybody knows this these days. I just remember from being in graduate, you know, from the 80s. Um, you get an equation, you can transform the response variable in there you know, the displacement variable, into an equation that looks like this. That was his original motivation. So I'm telling you this because you will, you will be, as you go on, you'll be amazed at where these uh, Bessel's equation arises. It's not, it's, it happens very often in circular geometries, but in wave systems, but it can happen in all kinds of places. So these, the solutions cannot be represented in terms of simple functions, you know, normal, standard functions. Um, unless you're asymptotically, we've talked a little bit about this before, unless in special cases. So they're called Bessel functions, right? And the, there are two types of second order differential equation. There's two types of solutions, right? The ones that don't go to infinity at the origin, those are called Neumann functions, are the standard Bessel functions. These are the ones you've seen before. You saw them in 3119 for modes on a membrane, right? A circular membrane. You should have seen that. You saw that. Okay. So here they are. They have, um, they're ordered here. They, the M is called the order here. In our case, it's just a non-negative integer. Here, that's all we're going to need. And we have to have the boundary condition. We have to have this antinodal boundary condition at the radius, remember? Here. So we have to have this. Please note, the Bessel function doesn't vanish at the rim the derivative vanishes. So this is not, this is where we deviate from the membrane here. <coughs> you know, the membrane satisfies the wave equation. So, so far, it's looked like, oh, this is, it's going to be just like a membrane here. Well, this is where uh, we deviate right here. It's not, it doesn't vanish. It's an anti-node. Uh, yeah, so the slope is equal to zero. So the zeros of this are called J prime. That, li that little prime there is very important. Without that prime, now you're talking about the zeros of Jm. So I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but this is standard. Everybody in the world uses this notation, little j. And we distinguish the zeros of J and the zeros of the slope by no prime and by a prime there. And these are tabulated in the back of the book. Um, so here's the complete solution.
all right? And we're going to use, we're going to use it's appropriate here to think, it's be, uh, best in this case to think of these modes as these, as, we'll call these the azimuthal modes, the modes that change as you vary theta. We, um, <coughs> we could use the sine and the cosine, but it's, I think it's better to use this, where you can arbitrarily set this phase. And I'll, on the diagram, I'll, I'll point this out to you. This is the usual pipe mode, and here's the Bessel function. So um, I don't know if I completed this when we talked about this before, but the water cooler mode, when the bubble, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, at a water cooler, when a bubble comes up, it excites a bunch of modes. And after a while, it's just the fundamental mode. And what does the fundamental mode look like? I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's beautiful. It's, it looks, here's the, the water cooler, here's the axis of symmetry. Here's the equilibrium location of the water. Okay. All right, I'll make it more realistic. This is closed off there. So what does the mode look like? And it's going back and forth. It's oscillating, right? Beautiful mode. Has anyone ever noticed this? Are there, uh, do water coolers exist anymore? Oh, okay. I haven't seen one for a while. Oh, no, I know. I know, I know where there's one. I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Um, but anyway, if, if you can see the, you know, the, the large, typically five-gallon jug here, you, this is a really beautiful mode. That's J0. That's a zeroth order Bessel function. And that's what we can have acoustically. So we have the same boundary conditions there. Unlike the membrane. The membrane has to be fixed at the end. <coughs> OK, so here's the spectrum. Okay, it's, so, it's a little bit more complicated than before, but the same <coughs> idea. And now that these zeros come in here, because we've, we have to have we, in order, the, the, zeros of the, the zeros of the slope of the Bessel function come in here because of that boundary condition. They come in here. So the modes are labeled by M and an N. We're going to suppress the Z mode for right now. Okay, like I said, in the experiment, you'll <coughs> go to a high enough frequency to see the first one, just to see that it's there, okay? But that's basically all. The rest of the experiment is going to be dealing with in two dimensions here. We're going to do, the, we'll do the same thing here. Um, and here are <coughs> some of the low frequency modes. Here's the, here's the zero two mode. It doesn't start <coughs> at one. Okay. And it, and I comment on that in here. J, and the reason it doesn't is this is equal to zero. And you can see it right here. The first solution for J0, when M is equal to 0, the first 0 is right here. This is the second 0. So we don't have, th that corresponds to a mode of 0 frequency. So we have to start off at 2 here. So here's the first, um, we call this radial mode. This is the lowest frequency radial mode. You can march off to infinity this way, analogously with a pipe. Here's the next one up. This is a nodal circle. Right? That's the water cooler mode. And, oh, you notice, you know, this is not a sinusoid, right? This is smaller than that. And you can clearly see that in the water cooler. Clearly see it. So what I'm writing down right now is we need a, we need a demo of this. We need a water cooler. It, you know, it's fun. I'm the head of the, the demonstrations lab, and the, we order the strangest things. And a lot of times people think, oh, you're, you're, this is for personal, you're using this for personal reasons. You know, you're, you're getting basketballs. We ordered a bunch of basketballs. And, oh, medicine balls. Medicine balls. Yeah, but, you know, I think they're used to, almost used to us by now. But I think we need to get a water cooler so we can demonstrate this mo or do some kind of a demo of this. Right? It's really, because it's obvious that you guys haven't seen it. Or you don't care. I don't, I don't know which. <laughs> but, uh, really pardon me? We really remember if there was water cooler in class right now. Yeah. When you see it. Yeah. Peop, you know, pe oh, God. People have done research on demos. Students remember demos. 
Students can come back years after they've gone from institutions and say, oh, I remember that demo you did, you know. Especially if there's an accident. <laughs> or it doesn't work, it drastically doesn't work, they really remember that. <laughs> okay, so you can march off here, okay? These are radial modes. You can also, I'm kind of, I guess I'm marching this way now, I kind of switch things here. You can, um, this mode, it's like that, can you guess what we call that? Think of the water cooler. Now that's, if I shook the water cooler like this, or you take a cup of coffee, and you go like this, we call it the sloshing mode, okay? So, so the, the surface waves here in water is exact, mathematically identical to the acoustic modes here. So this is the sloshing mode here. Um, and I don't know if you can feel this or have a feeling for it. This frequency is lower than that frequency. In a circular cup, the surface, uh, surface waves in there, the lowest frequency is the sloshing mode, the fundamental sloshing mode right here. It's going like this. Um, so you can march off this way to infinity and keep putting more and more nodal diameters in here. Okay, this is an azimuthal mode here. You can also have mixed modes. There are mixed modes there. Now, the, finally, the interesting question here is what's the order of these modes? It's not at all obvious. Okay, it depends upon the, the zeros of J prime, the, of the, of the you know, zero slope of the vessel functions, right? So, but here's the, I've written them down for you here. This is actually the order. The, the lowest is the sloshing. The next one is the 2 1 mode. This is not this. You keep wanting to, you keep saying, well, this, you want this to be the fundamental, okay? And it's different than a membrane. The membrane, this is the fundamental. The, I don't know what to call it. The mode where you have no, no nodes for a fixed like that, that's the fundamental. So it's very different here. Finally, I think it's eventually you'll hit the, uh, there it is. It's not until there that you get this order. Now, so this is a little complicated, depends on the Bessel functions, but it's universal. Before we had a box, we could change the aspect ratio. What, what do we change here? That's not going to make any difference, right? We don't care. The overall size it has the same shape. This shape is different than that shape. So these are, this is a universal ordering here. All cylindrical cavities. Not worrying about the Z modes, you know, the pipe modes. This is going to be the order. I, I wrote down the first 10 modes there. Um, <coughs> okay. So, that over again. So that's it. Anybody have any quick questions? <coughs>